wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey everybody, welcome. It's Ken Reed here, your TV Guidance Counselor on the show, TV Guidance Counselor, the show where each and every week I talk to a fascinating person about what we watched on television, the television they made, the movies they made, the entertainment they were a part of, using back issues of TV Guide magazine from my personal collection that I hand scan myself into PDFs as sort of the gateway to our collective past. And this week's guest is someone I've wanted to talk to for a long, long time. And we just weren't able to make it work schedule wise, literally for years. We talk about that a little bit here and I've always loved her work. She's been in so many great things, uh, but we were able to do it now due to COVID and me moving the show remotely for the last year. But it's not all bad. My guest this week is Catherine Mary Stewart, who listeners of this show know from a ton of stuff. But some of my favorites are Night of the Comet, The Last Starfighter. She's in The Apple, which we talk about right away. Uh, Dudes, which I talk about with Penelope Spheris in that episode. Uh, Weekend at Bernie's, which I talk about with Andrew McCarthy in that episode with him. Ton of TV and just is just a fascinating person, really fun to talk to. And I think you will enjoy hearing us talk because she's great. If you have people you would like me to try to get on the show, I always try to get them and I will try to get them. If you request them, whether I know them or not, you can email me at TV guidance counselor at gmail.com or Ken at I can or on social media at Kenneth W read R E I D or at TV guidance. Uh, also just like hearing from you in general, let me know how you're doing. Let me know what you're watching. Let me know what you've thought of episodes, you know, whatever you want to talk about. I always try to respond as quickly as possible. And I thank you guys for reaching out or you can go on our Patreon, patreon.com backslash TV guidance counselor. You give a dollar a month or a, a billion million dollars a month, whatever it is, but you can, send messages there. I've been putting some exclusive content up there, some episodes that didn't make the cut, but are interesting anyway, uh, some videos and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, trying to get more interactive on there regardless, enjoy this week's episode. It's really great. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV guidance counselor with my guest, Catherine Mary Stewart. TV is my friend and it has been always there for me. Catherine Mary Stewart, how are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Good. I like to say live via satellite because it makes it feel like uh, a pandemic quarantine is uh, fancier. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll go with that. <laughs> I'll go with that. Oh man, we're, we're just purpose. talking about yeah, just talking about getting you know to LA and stuff. That was sort of my respite against just everything i guess and now i'm here all the time and uh it's like i i i love new york and all that other stuff but um it's me and my husband and it was i think i've come to the conclusion that you know not being on top of each other all the time is is okay yeah yeah it's quite a (laughs) test uh and just knowing that you have los angeles to look forward to Oh, makes a big difference because that first snow yeah. you're like oh it's kind of pretty it's nice yeah, and yeah. in two weeks but then the rest no it can be pretty brutal uh, yeah we have this we have this uh field below us here where we are we're downtown new york we have this big field and every time it snows it's astroturf every time it snows some kid uh you know with with their feet sort of yep. shuffles out a giant penis of course every time it's just like really and we look down at it, it's like oh jeez. <laughs> i mean and it's it it goes from generation to generation i assume because it's just what? it's like really annoying i feel like opening the window going, god you idiots please every single time i'm picturing some guy teaching his kid to do it like passing on the tradition like your grandfather uh, taught me and now this is your job for the next 30 years and isn't it hilarious yep, yep. never change it although i bet if one time it snows and it's not there i bet you'll worry <laughs> you know what Actually, there was one time where it didn't show up. My husband and I were like, yay, 
we, we couldn't believe that it wasn't actually there. We were right. so happy. <laughs> and that it I, just, I don't know. There's something very unsettling to me about that. I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's sort of, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of like a snowy version of the wicker man in a really dumb way. Yeah. <laughs> So it really, really is. You're exactly right. So when I asked you to do the show, uh, you said, you know, I grew up in Canada, so I don't know if you have a Canadian TV guide, which uh, miraculously I did. And the <laughs> sort of year frame, you're like 70, late 70s, early 80s. And I had literally the, the only Canadian TV guides I had were from that time frame and yeah. from Edmonton where you grew up. <laughs> That's that's astonishing, first of all, that you found an Edmonton TV guide. And yes, I mean, I, it's great. I wish I had said like early 70s, because that was really when I was a kid in Edmonton. You know, that's really when I... W- primarily watched television because around 78, I had moved to London. Yeah. I was going to say this issue must've been right when you moved to London or. Cause I graduated high school in 77 and uh, then it must've been around 78. I was trying to remember exactly when I went, but it was like late 77, early 78. So, you know, I wasn't even, I mean, I obviously I recognize a lot of these shows and some of them, the Canadian ones I have great fondness for growing up with because they were still airing at that time. But I was really living in London at that point. Which had zero TV really to pick from in 70. But I imagine, (laughs) I mean, you were doing London, like you were studying dance, I think, right? Was that I was was studying dance. Yeah. Yeah. Not a ton of, uh, of uh, television, but they had some very interesting uh, programs in London, like darts and snooker. Yes. And one of the, the the most fascinating shows, which I actually loved, was uh, sheepdogs rounding up sheep. There yes. were these competitions. Oh, you yes. lived there, right? Yeah. You lived there, did no, you? Yeah, in the early 2000s. Yeah, I lived there. And it was okay, the same stuff. Yeah, on Sundays, it would be like sports. But the sports <laughs> would be darts and snooker and like four and, days of, of sheep herding. Oh my God. It was the best though, wasn't it? Yeah. I, 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 honest to God, I love that so much watching these guys and their, you know, uh, pantaloons or whatever the heck it was, and their, little, <laughs> their little caps just whistling and the dogs are like, dong, 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 and whipping these poor animals into a stereo and then it's into a pen. And it's like, <laughs> I don't know. I am, I'm enjoying this, but I don't think the sheep are necessarily. No, no. And the novelty wears off quick too. Like the first couple times you watch it, you're like, this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this. And then by like the fourth week, you're like, God, I wish there'd be something entertaining. On. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I mean, back then when I was there, it was like ITV was the big new thing. And, um, but that, yeah, I didn't really watch a ton of television there, but because yeah. then you, we'll get to the guy in a minute here, but just because we brought it up, the the first gig you got was this massive, bizarre movie, The Apple. As <laughs> what the do you lead. mean bizarre? It's totally. Well, what are you talking about? I, you know, it's it's. I, it was a I real realistic uh, version of what 1999 would look like. Come yeah, on. and it was scarily accurate. Scary, right? right? Yes. Oh, I know. <laughs> a very weird European movie because it's it's sort of about. I, I assume my listeners of all people have seen the Apple, but it's uh, sort of a. I love your listeners. Oh, thank you. Uh, a fictionalized <laughs> version of the future Eurovision Song Contest, which is a thing I didn't know about till I moved to London. Uh, right, which me neither. Bizarre, and is sort of a Faust. Adam and Eve allegory. Uh, and you shot, I think, in West Germany. Did you shoot in West Germany? We did. Yeah. We shot in Berlin and we shot in other parts of West Germany. Exactly. But but the most interesting and the most time we spent was in Berlin and the wall was still up. Yeah. The wall didn't come down for another, what was it? When did it come down? Uh, like 90, 10 years? 91 or 92, I think. So, or 90. Yes, was, was it like that? Or, yeah. But it was very interesting because we had access to East Berlin, you know, as Westerners. Eastern Berliners were not allowed out. Nobody could leave, but we could go in. So one day, Joss Ackland, who played, you know, God. the big God, basically. <laughs> Mr. Big. <laughs> Mr. Big, and then the head hippie. Oh, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> Makes total sense. But at any rate, um, he and I got on a train. We went through Checkpoint Charlie, and it was just the most 
bizarre experience I think I've ever had. And it certainly didn't speak well to communism, basically, because literally no one could leave. No one was allowed to leave that place. And you got there. And Berlin, on the other hand, West Berlin, was almost like the antithesis in that it, 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 because West Berlin was kind of nestled in East Germany, um, it was almost like a circus there. Everything was extreme from nightlife to the gay community to everything was just like crazy. And then you take this train through Checkpoint Charlie into uh, East Berlin and it's just dead. There are very few people anywhere. It's all sort of gray and concrete, very few uh, plants or trees or foliage of any kind. It was it. It was really super creepy, um, but fascinating, you know, it just incredible to do. And, and Joss Ackland misplaced his passport. Of course, you had to have a passport oh, to go there. That's like the worst he missed, nightmare. Oh, he was freaking out. I forget exactly how he found it, but um, he did. Luckily, but that it, it was very interesting, very interesting experience for sure. Because that is, you know, for someone who grew up in Edmonton and you basically, <laughs> I imagine, didn't, did you travel really outside of where you grew up much when you were growing up? We did travel a lot, okay. actually. Um, my dad uh, was a professor of the at the University of Alberta and every seven years or so they were granted like a, a sabbatical leave. Uh, it's a sort of a research leave. And he always especially uh, when my brother was in high school and uh, I was in junior high and my other brother was, I guess, maybe in high school too. Um, he was granted a sabbatical and he decided because we were at that age where we would sort of appreciate it and it would probably be the last time we could travel as a family. We literally traveled all over the world. Wow. We, we uh, spent like, five, six months in Barbados. My dad was a marine biologist. Yep. So he did a whole bunch of research in um, Barbados. And then that was the main place. Then we traveled all over and ended up in Australia for like nine months um, where he worked off the Great Barrier Reef. And um, then of course we traveled all over Australia. We traveled Indonesia. We did uh, India, uh, Africa, we, Egypt, all over Europe. I mean, we spent 16 months traveling so and it was incredible. That probably inoculated you a little bit from like, if you had just gone from Edmonton to London to Berlin, you're just would not have been able to comprehend what was going on, <laughs> I imagine. Right. Right. I mean, we had also spent a lot of time in London, like the first sabbatical that he took when I was really, really young. We were in London the entire time. So, so um, too alien then. You're kind of at, at ease there. Right. Uh, and, my wife- and I have a bunch of uh, relatives there too. And yeah. so it, it was for me when I decided to pursue this whole dance thing, I was thinking, do I want to go to Toronto? And I thought, oh, that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> or do I want to go just because, you know, it was in Canada. Yeah. And our parents also, uh, I have two older brothers, they always encouraged us to Fly the nest, you know? Because right. some of your um, other explore. siblings are in entertainment as well, right? They're or sort of documentary type stuff or science. Well, TV. yeah, it's it, it, it's so funny how my brothers kind of in a backwards sort of way ended up on the periphery of entertainment, I guess. My, my one old, uh, brother is, he uh, used to do this show for public television in Canada called... Um, uh, uh, what was it called? Science in the city. And then big L something rather, but he would do like, you know, science experiments in public and then invite people to participate and stuff. And then he would also like, he, he, he was, <laughs> Oh my God. He hurt himself so many times. <laughs> he, um, he, he would do things like, I'm going to figure skate with the best figure skater in Canada. And so he's six, four and like 200 and something pounds. And he'd get out there and figure skates and almost kill himself. And then there's some sport. I mean, I haven't been in Canada for a long time, but there's some sport where they literally skate down a mountain of ice. Oh, slalom. No, I mean, that's, that's skiing, but I, I think there literally is this 
horrible sport. Uh, oh, you're in like a sled. That thing is it? Yeah. No, you're oh. on skates. Oh, that's insane. It's insane. <laughs> And he did that. And he's like, you know, done stuff with the military and jumped out of planes and uh, all sorts of crazy things. And he's injured himself several times. So he he was doing that. But he's he is a geologist and he his job was uh, heading up this thing called Science North in Sudbury, Ontario. And then this was sort of a side thing that he did, which he enjoyed doing. And he came to New York a few times, actually. And I would always go, you know, see him on location. <laughs> That's what having encouraging parents gets you. Uh, well, I'm, yeah, I guess. I'm not sure <laughs> if I would do what he did, frankly. Uh, my other brother, uh, he at one point was teaching script writing. And then he was also, uh, he would do, um, you know, sort of teaching videos for people like firemen and, and you know, uh, industrials, they would call them. Industrial, yeah. right? Exactly. He would sort of do industrials, which would uh, not only would he do the voiceovers for them, but he would go on location and shoot stuff, and um, yeah, things like that. Uh, so yeah, it's it's interesting because my parents were both academics, but who are you talking to? I, it's so funny. I, I was like up half the night listening to some of the people you interview oh, because I know a lot of them. Yeah, right? oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, like Penelope oh, yeah. and Kelly, and yeah. <laughs> Kelly, have you ever done Lance? Yes. No, I've never had Lance on. I'd love to have Lance on. He'd be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll totally um, put a good word oh, in for you. you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I'm trying to remember who it was. It might have been Scott Valentine or Jim Beaver. That's oh, who Jim it Beaver, was. Yeah. <gasps> oh, Jim Beaver, yeah. I love Jim Beaver. I, I met Jim through his wife, Cecily, and uh, we worked together. Um, and we became really, really good friends. Uh, and we're still really good friends to this day. He's such a, an amazing, smart, intel, you know, oh, he's so fascinating. smart. Yeah. He's is, fascinating, yeah. isn't it? That was a really great interview. Oh, thank you. Um, but he was talking about how, because you asked, do you have performers in your family? And, you know, in a sense, I grew up with these academic parents, but it's the same for me. My dad, watching him, uh, speak in front of a classroom at university, absolutely a performer. And, and we were very, we were a very animated family, I have to say. And when my, uh, it was my mother actually who introduced me to acting and dance. Um, so I have her to thank for this <laughs> because I, my brothers were both honor students and blah, blah, blah. And then there was me. And she was like, okay, what are we going to do with her? And she sort of led me or guided me to, uh, you know, taking acting in school. And then I had, you know, he, and she, she encouraged me to take dance. And um, those were the things that really stuck. Yeah. Cause it, it's, you're sort of destined for a path in some ways, but it, it really is kind of a, a weird, like almost immediate, this big gig you get. It was pretty soon after you'd moved there, right? It was sort of the, I, I did a, a bunch of time there and then I came home and then I went back and that's when I was cast in the Apple. Right. And it was, it was totally crazy chance. You know, I, a, a lot of your interviews say, Oh, the luck involved. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Although you may debate the luck involved with the apple, but <laughs> I would say it's very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, it started my career, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because um, you end up you didn't you hadn't done any real dancer acting in Canada itself before you got that, right? Was it kind of? Well, I was with a company, so I've been dancing professionally for a while with this company, just kind of. Uh, called Synergy. Um, we performed sort of in the province and then we were hired to uh, be a part of a, a variety show for the UN peacekeeping forces oh, okay. <laughs> in uh, Israel, Egypt and um, Cyprus. So that was an interesting thing. So I had performed, I mean, Ironically, I, or not, I mean, I am most comfortable on stage. I mean, my career is basically built on being in front of a camera, which is completely different. But um, I, I love, I love perf being on stage and performing. So yeah, I mean, it was, and also where I trained in Canada and and in London, it was really a performing arts school. You know, so we were, it was a lot of dance, but there was acting and singing and all. It was very rounded. So I wasn't going in completely cold, right. for sure. 
Right. So let's dive in here a little bit and see uh, what you kind of picked and what stuck out to you uh, okay. this week in, in Edmonton, Canada. You said before we started recording, you're like, wow, that was a pretty barren yeah. Yeah, it was like a desert. It was a desert TV guide yes. for me. I mean, in a way, I did. I was pretty entertained by a lot of the ads. I have, you know, the like. There's a lot of liquor. Oh yes. There's lots and lots of liquor going on, and understandably so. It's kind of it's cold. You know, you, it, it, it's cold, and and apparently, if you have alcohol in your blood, you won't freeze to death. <laughs> or you won't care as much. <laughs> you, you certainly won't care as much. Yeah. yeah. You could um, you could order a giant uh, six foot long, two and a half foot high bridge that you could make with your family. <laughs> right. Uh, there's yeah the bridge. Um, let's see what yeah lots of lots of alcohol. Oh this was <laughs> this cracks me up on page uh, nine. I was I was like. What's Roger Ebert doing there? I thought the same exact thing. It's for the listeners. I will post this photo. It is not Roger Ebert. This is a woman named Judy LaMarche. Uh, Judy LaMarche. Who's writing a, a, a column about a uh, 19th century view that the public has a right to know has been replaced by a 20th century belief that the public has a right to be entertained. It's like this editorial. That's pretty it's heady. It's like an editorial. Yeah. Looks yes. exactly like-, like Roger Ebert. I know. Um, but she was, you know, highly respected intellectual critic person and, and a politician. Um, so where TV has gone wrong. Yeah. They turned it into entertainment. How dare they? It should just be educational. This was not meant, which is a very sort of BBC, CBC, public it, television right. lookout. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, which we, we got some. Uh, the, one of the big differences I've noticed between American TV Guide and, and Canadian TV Guide, which were two different companies, weirdly. Um, were they? Oh, interesting. They started, I think, originally, but they broke off some time in the 70s, so they ended up being totally different companies. Is, uh-huh. Although we had some sort of academic articles in TV Guide, and you know the ones I mentioned, like Harlan Ellison and Isaac Asimov and Eleanor Roosevelt wrote some stuff, the Canadian one really dove into that especially in the 70s and 80s and there's like some mm. like hard news editorials in these <laughs> that seem really oh weird. for sure in the tv guy yeah there was another one about um, subliminal messaging yes <laughs> they're really pissed off about the subliminal messaging that's going on on t- or some anyway yeah, it's uh, the I, advertising I, I high... like, yeah brainwashing children and media yeah, and how whole... dare they and it was like yeah, you know, it doesn't really work, the subliminal. Right, <laughs> right. Although that was huge at that time, that like sort of Cold yeah. War fascination with like, they're brainwashing us. And then. Yeah, this yeah, was exactly. Also, you know, it's Marshall McEwen Canadian, I th- McLuhan Canadian, I think. Um, um, but he had maybe. that whole, you know, the, the medium is the message and that whole like anti television thing. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of this, this sort of makes sense to me uh, in a way that being a huge David Cronenberg fan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and looking at this sort of stuff in the air in 78 and seeing like Videodrome in 81, <laughs> like in that same yeah. area, it kind of makes yeah. a little bit more sense to contextualize that for me, which is, which I found kind of fascinating looking through this. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I, I also, by the way, just to go back to old Judy there, um, that the, the ad next to it, I just like <laughs> scroll down there. They're like, have you been trying to, it's a smoking ad for Vantage cigarettes, right? Yeah. Have you been trying to quit? I, I, I'm whatever. I'm, I'm not saying exactly right, but if uh, it's, it's, this is a, 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 it's a light drag or something. Cause they've hollowed out the, the, uh, the, the filter, yeah. the filter, the filter. I'm not a smoker. Obviously. Me either, they've yeah. hollowed out the filter so that it's easier to get the smoke. And somehow that's supposed to be better for you than smoking a regularly filtered cigarette it cracked me. Anyway, it's insane. Times it's, are a change. It's acknowledging <laughs> that smoking is a problem while yeah. advertising smoking. Like the headline literally says smoking. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. Smoke these uh, sort of indicating that it might be better for you. And it's like, this can't be better for you. The, the filter is hollow. You don't, it <laughs> says, you don't have to work hard getting the smoke through. So all that joy of smoking is lost. <laughs> Is anyone like, oh man, I I'm wiped. I had to smoke uh, yeah, yeah. so hard. 
<laughs> yeah, it's exhausting smoking a cigarette. Right. And uh, anyway, that that cracked me up that little lot. But. Yeah, it's a little snapshot of sort of the world at that time. Because and then again, before it gets into the listings, there's a wonderful ad for something you can order at home: uh, crystal pendants. Oh yeah. <laughs> With yeah, a I saw those. seahorse or a cross or maybe just the word love, whatever you want, you can you can advertise that crystal pendant right on you there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And looking at this, you have like four or five choices for each hour. There's not a lot. No, it's it's like I said, it's kind of barren. I was like, God, I'm kind of glad I was watching sheep herding in London because <laughs> there's not much going on here. Let's say most of the programming that I recall was American. I mean, we did have like a big one for us in our family was hockey night in Canada. Um, very every we ate dinner in front of um, the television that on Saturday, Saturday nights yep. because that's when we watched hockey. I have two older brothers, and and so I didn't have any say in it. Uh, but no, I you know I really did love uh, hockey, and I had you know Phil Esposito. I thought it was really cute and all this junk. <laughs> <laughs> But um, my mother was always like him. I'm like, yeah, he's like, my like guy. Him. Yeah, yeah, and and so we were very involved with hockey night in Canada. But this is June, so obviously there's no hockey night in Canada. Um, I'm trying to figure out. I'm, I'm trying to turn the pages here. I'm not oh, yeah, very good at no this. Problem. Yeah, a Canadian um, friend of mine said if you ever wanted to commit a crime and get away with it in Canada, just do it during hockey night in Canada, and you could waltz in anywhere, commit a crime, and totally get away with it. <laughs> absolutely. And the other one was on Sunday was Wonderful World of Disney. That was like a classic for sure. We were, my parents were, or specifically probably my mother was very, very strict with our television watching. And it, which was a, a drag, especially in high school, because everyone in high school ran home and watched the soaps. And then that's what you would talk about the next day. Well, I was not allowed to watch the soaps, but I, <laughs> I managed to figure it out because my mother, <laughs> We're, uh, she taught at university and she didn't get home until, say, say I got home at 3.30. She would get home about 10 to 4, something like that. I would run into the house. I would turn on the TV. I'd watch as much soap opera as I possibly could, which was not allowed. And then I could hear the garage door opening. It was an electric door attached to the house. So I could hear it opening. I would switch off the TV and run upstairs. And, um, but at least I caught some of the soap opera. Well, my mother caught on to this by, I don't know how she knew, but she would feel the television to warm. see if it was warm. Yeah. And so what she did then was I, I came home the next day after she'd figured it out. You know, she didn't say anything to me. Um, she figured it out, though. I came home and I tried to turn the TV on. You know, we didn't have the remotes. I, we never had a remote in my house. Um, you turn it and it wouldn't go on. I couldn't turn the television on. And I'm like, what the hell? The, what did she do? And I think... She may have gotten away with that once because then the garage door goes. And I'm like, damn, I run upstairs <laughs> to my room. She unplugged the TV. She'd unplugged the television. And I figure I did figure it out. But then there was the issue of she's totally going to check to see if it's Oh, warm. yeah. So you got to cool it down before she gets home. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh it up, you know. I don't know. Put a fan on it or something. Anyway, yeah. So we... You know, we weren't allowed to watch a ton of television. Um, and then they were really strict about getting us to bed on time and all that other stuff. But I, I had my bedroom was right above the um, family room and the heat vent yes. in my room literally connected with the family room downstairs. I would like lie down on the floor and listen. Yeah. It was so sad. You know? Oh Just, yeah. If, if you explain that to kids now that you're like, I could, I'd put my ear to the floor so I could hear like the late night show or whatever. Right. I remember listening to, uh, Anne of a Thousand Days, yeah, that was on. And they put me off to bed and probably right, well, what happened there? Because I remember uh, seeing some of it. 
And uh, I think I went to bed and then I was listening to it. I think I must have gone back downstairs to sing because I was fascinated. I really just wanted to see it like Nick Thirsty or something like right, that. Right, right. And I ended up watching some of it. They let me sit there, but it was pretty traumatic because I don't know if you remember that movie on a thousand days, but there was a lot of torture and oh, shit yeah. going on. Yeah. And I remember watching that as a little kid and going, Oh, this is kind of gross. Yeah, I have made a mistake watching this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is this is not a soothing thing. And I think my parents were sort of like, let's see how it works with her, you know, but we'll test the water and see if she can handle this. Test the water a little bit. Yeah. So I think one of the early gigs you got when you moved back to the U.S. was on a soap. <laughs> That's right. On Days of Our Lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I was it weird. I, I it, <laughs> it's a very broad is, is that question. Clear? Yeah, um, I mean, was it were you, was it like you're like this is the forbidden fruit show? <laughs> you're like, no, no, I really didn't feel like that. I I I was happy to get a job. I literally had no money anymore. I had been in L.A. for quite a while, and I never actually got a job as a waiter or anything like that. I'd done a couple of episodic things like Knight Rider and um, I don't know, something else. And um, when I got Days of Our Lives, I literally had no money and I was so happy to get this show. I wasn't really that familiar with Days of Our Lives. I, I hadn't been following it. I must have been watching like All My Children or something like that in Edmonton. Uh, I didn't know the characters very well, but I got the job. And I remember the first day driving up to the NBC lot, I ran out of gas oh, outside God. the gates. And so I had to run in and, you know, do the whole thing. And I my first day was... Uh, Tough. It was tough, man. Uh, soap operas are tough. It's really, it's hard because, you know, you're shooting, especially something like Days of Our Lives, an hour program in one day, as opposed to, you know, six weeks or whatever. Normally in a movie, it could be two months, uh, a television show, as little as a week, maybe. But comparatively speaking, and especially if you have a really strong storyline, it's hard. And I don't have this really, you know, natural, it drives me crazy. These actors go, well, I'm really good at memorizing. So I just uh, look at it either. once and boom. Yeah. I'm like, are you out of your ever loving mind? Um, so it was tough. But the, like the first day I was on there, I was the Kayla Brady nurse. And I come out in the hospital. My job is to tell all the regular castmates about somebody who was injured in the hospital or something like that. And in soap operas, you sort of, you kind of uh, repeat the history in every episode. So if you haven't watched the show for four years, you just need to watch one and you'll, right. you know, pick up where you left off. So I had to name everyone as I was explaining what was happening to whoever it was, Bo or something. And, um, I got all the names wrong. I didn't know who these people were. You know, it wasn't like when you take a script home, you go, oh yeah, Marlena, and what's her face? La, 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 la. No, there's no picture next to them. So right. I'm like, uh, and I just, I, I suppose I could have gotten, if I was, I don't know, I screwed it up. And they literally stopped. They're like, uh, that's not my name. You know, <laughs> can we cut? And in soap operas, I think you're talking to Kelly about this. Yeah. You don't cut. You never cut. If you can possibly not do it, they will not cut. On occasion, I would kind of look directly into the camera and go, oh. <laughs> Just because <laughs> then you have to cut. <laughs> and you have to cut. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. so I was on that for a couple of years. But that was that was tough, man. That yeah. was, I found that very hard. That's like boot camp for acting. And, and people... In a way, it can be dangerous, though, because you... Because there's so much pressure, you kind of fall into this routine of acting. You know, you just do it the same way every time. And I mean, one of the things about being on a soap opera for an extended period of time, it, it's almost like second nature. You know your character so well, you know everybody. It's just like you practically know what the writers are going to write. In my case, it was not that. <laughs> right, right. So it was always a, like a mystery. I'm like, oh my God. 
<laughs> but you kind of do it's like you do a two or three year tour of one of the of a soap opera and then you kind of have to get out or you end up being there forever like a lot of people and yeah so i was really lucky that, that way i was really lucky because i got the last starfighter while i was still on days of our lives and so that when they didn't renew my contract i had already done the last starfighter and that gave me sort of some cred things really sort of snowballed after that for movies and stuff like that. Cause that movie got huge amounts of press. Like they really promote, I mean, they had record tie, you know, book tie-ins and like, this was oh, yeah. giant. comic books. Um, they were, they even talked about Atari ta- talked about recreating the, the game, um, which never actually happened because I don't know that there's all sorts of re, uh, you know theories about why it didn't do better, but it was it was a small movie and and you know it was at an era of Star Wars and all these big super lavish giant things, and this was just a sweet little you know relatable thing that just didn't get the the press or the publicity that it probably needed. Um, and we were all unknowns, basically, except for Robert Preston and, right. <laughs> you know, um, Dana Hurlicky. But Lance and I were, we weren't a big, massive draw. Yeah. I anyway. mean, we had done Halloween 2, I think, just before, maybe. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, was that your second movie? Was it the second movie you ever did? Uh, uh, well, sort of. I did a movie in Edmonton. Oh, you don't know this one? Oh wait, it's this the ski movie? The the it's like a teen Damn. Yeah, it's called uh um, I thought I got you. Oh no, one. you almost Damn. did. I've only seen it once. It's got is it like powder heads or something like that? That's, yes. See, what is going on? You're, you've got this brain that is so full of information, oh, and yeah. it's it's insane how it much is. you know. And it's not <laughs> useful to anyone. <laughs> are you kidding me it's incredible for this this sort of this, platform holy moly i was doing an episode with my friend eugene merman who's on bob's burgers now and uh mm-hmm. i forget what i i i knew something and he goes you could have been a doctor it's <laughs> <laughs> like i don't know if that would have worked that wouldn't have been as much fun yeah, that's true um yeah yeah yes uh yeah so it was called Powderheads. it was at that time there were a lot of um mostly kind of documentary style ski movies with stunt skiing and these people doing all these incredible things and on skis, you know, um, I forget the name of, he's a very famous, uh, ski, um, cameraman and, and producer. Um, he, he, so that was really trending at that time, especially in places like Canada, uh, really beautiful, films of skiing and just virgin snow and uh, doing amazing things. So uh, the producers of this decided to create a a narrative and incorporate this kind of skiing if possible. (laughs) And it was supposed to be funny. Um, You haven't seen it, I take it. I've not seen it. I remember, (laughs) it it seems like it's somewhat hard to see. I remember seeing a video of it at my local video store uh, growing up and confusing it with like uh, Hot Dog the Movie or, Uh, uh, you know, one of the other ski sort of teen comedies. Right. Yeah. So it was that genre for sure. And it was just, it was just a really, really, I'd just done the Apple and I was home for Christmas and a friend of mine who's a casting director suggested me for this thing and I ended up doing it and it's uh <laughs> Canadian um, tax shelter something film? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know actually I think that the the producers wanted or just like really enthusiastic movie makers and um they really they thought this was going to be great and uh, it, it was fun it was interesting to do um I got you know I got to do some great skiing because we shot in uh Jasper, I think, um, a lot of it. And I was, I've skied all my life. So we had some really great equipment and ski suits and things like that. So when I wasn't shooting, I got to do a little skiing, but I didn't tell them I was doing it because then they'd be going, no, yeah. are you <laughs> <The> insurance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Last Starfighter was your third movie. Uh, although third movie, we could say the second one was sort of a paid ski vacation in some ways. <laughs> In some ways, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, The Last Starfighter, it is, to your point, it's sort of like 85% sort of an indie character movie. 
<laughs> and then 15% big star, you know, uh, sci-fi movie. <laughs> Right. And yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there is all this stuff in outer space and, and that was like at the birth of CGI, right? Uh, a lot of the CGI in that was, you know, created for the movie that had never been created before, um, which I didn't even know until it was, I think it was the 25th anniversary or something or the 20th anniversary screening in Santa Monica that I went to where they had all the technical people oh, for cool. a Q and a afterwards. Yeah. And, um, this is where I learned how cutting edge it actually was. It really was the foundation for CGI today. They were, they weren't sure if they were going to use just you know, regular special effects with models and all that other stuff, or this new thing that they were trying to create. And so while we were shooting, they were creating programs and um, just trying to, apparently there was a bunch of them in a room, just working the computers, trying to come up with a way of creating these kind of special effects. And apparently every once in a while, be like, Eureka, I figured <laughs> out a code or something I like did. that. And, and apparently they didn't, um, it wasn't as sophisticated as they were hoping it would be if they had more time, but they didn't have more time. So, um, but it, that was fascinating to me because truly, you know, Tron was out at around the same time and people compare the special effects, but it's not the same. No, not at all. Believe it or not, uh, the last Starfighter, the special effects were so much more sophisticated in terms of um, you know, computer generated special effects. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. Cause all the scenes you're in are, are the sort of earthbound sort of, <laughs> yeah. sort of trailer <laughs> park stuff, you know, it's, which is still yeah. fascinating, but of course you wouldn't have seen or known any of that stuff. Cause you, you go no. see the movie at the premiere and you're like, wow, there's a big, there's a big space fight in this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I had no idea how they did it. And I, I probably didn't even think about it, frankly. It's pretty cool. Were you like now that I've, because at that time you you were a TV actor or a movie actor basically like you didn't do both for the most part for people and where you're like now I've I've moved on back onto movies this is where mm -hmm. I'm at now and I'm not mm -hmm. going to go back to TV where you're like it's movies from now yeah. on you know that was the, uh, the that was the mentality at the time as I know you know it's it was like when you're cast in a movie you are now in movies and you don't do television. Um, so yeah, which is, it's unfortunate because there were some opportunities, which uh, probably would have at least elongated my financial support, if not, oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was, I, I have no regrets. I, I, I sort of went from, I did like the last starfighter, neither the comet mischief. And then I started doing some like lots of mini series yeah. and things like that. Hollywood uh, wives, it, Hollywood wives, which was incredible considering the cast. I mean, um, Aaron, uh, spelling, he, he thought I was great, <laughs> you know, and, and he, 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 he cast me in this and then he cast me in a, a TV series, which was basically a Vegas version of the love boat called hearts are wild. <laughs> um, and yeah, he really liked me. So I, I got to do that, which was incredible, incredible cast. Um, I did another mini series called sins, uh, and then a thing called passion and paradise. The mini series were very big in the eighties and they, they were cast with some pretty big names too. These poor actors that are just, you know, Rod Steiger right. and all, all these people who weren't working in features for whatever reason. And they just needed to make some money. I, I really think that, that they were like, like Hollywood wives was not, you know, the most intellectual piece. And, but there was, there was a cast of thousands. So they were being yeah. paid well. And I was really fortunate enough to be able to work with a lot of these people. Were there, was there anyone that you were really starstruck by or that you had watched growing up that you were like, oh, wow, I'm here on a set with this person? Because there are huge <sighs> names in those movies. Huge names. Um, well, you know, let's see. <laughs> I don't know. 
pull out my cast list here. <laughs> or anyone that you were like, what, do, are you the kind of person who would like pick their brains or sort of like tell me about, you know, the old days kind of person? Or were you kind of like too intimidating? No, I was coach? so young. I, in fact, in Hollywood Wives, Angie Dickinson kind of took me under her wing because I was young and I... It, it, Everybody had been in the business for some time and they were all like buddy, buddy and having a really good time. And I was not included in all that. Right. And Angie would sort of take me under her wing and, and just, I don't know, she just made me feel more welcome. But I was very young and shy and I didn't want to like tread on anybody. Um, uh, you know, she was incredible. I have great memories of Angie. She was so sweet to me, which I will never forget and always appreciate. I mean, I remember Candace Bergen, who was just to me one of the most beautiful women. Um, I, I, I was kind of in awe and starstruck by a lot of these people, but um, I didn't necessarily approach them. I right. didn't feel worthy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, most of us are like that where you're like, you, you right. kind of feel like, wow, I'm kind of lucky to be here. Uh, almost. Yeah. And like, I can't believe this. Uh, you know, I don't want to make anyone mad. <laughs> right. Right. And they probably didn't want me bugging them anyway. You know, like in the uh, sins, I was the young Joan Collins. Yes. I'm not sure how I got cast as that, but because I don't look anything like Joan Collins. No. And when they do this, they sort of do this flashback. She's sort of remembering her horrible past, which was actually a really terrific role because the character um, lived through Nazi-occupied France. So I was supposed to be French, but I had an English accent because I was Joan Collins and I get tortured by these Nazis. And then I become, I, I get through World War II and I um, become this model by chance. And I work my way up through the modeling industry until I become Joan Collins's character, who, Alain Junot, <laughs> who, um, who is, is sort of, she becomes huge, big, famous, rich. I don't know why exactly I forget now, <laughs> but uh, there's this moment where I tra there's a transition, there's a close up of my face, and the the transition becomes Joan Collins. It's like oh, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't Man. seem to work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Do you go so back funny. and watch things you were in, or did you at the time, or do you now? Is is it? You know, I I watch. I, I like to watch things by myself. I felt I always, as a kid, especially coming from this sort of academic, intellectual family, you know, I always felt judged, you know, because I wasn't quite, it would be like report card time. I wasn't stupid. I just, I was so bored in school. I just didn't like it very much. And my dad would sit me down and go over the, the report card. And I always felt so judge that's sort of a thing in me it's so weird that i'm an actor but i think a lot of people are like yeah. that that are actors it's sort of an outlet for them to be somebody else you know so i would i like to sit and watch something by myself and then uh, and my husband's very gracious he'll he'll be kind but if if uh, somebody wants to watch it after that. It's it. I, I don't want to be with them. Right. Right. Say. Right. Yeah. It's the self consciousness of like, oh, I don't want to, because you'll be watching them watching instead of watching it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm distracted about. Oh, I wonder what they're thinking about this. Oh no. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's hard to kind of yeah focus, but I I do I watch yeah. I love Night of the Comets, one of my favorite movies. And I'm like, yeah. you know, it'd be such a shame if you couldn't watch that and enjoy it because <laughs> it's like, you know, you remember what the, what you had for breakfast that day of the shoot, or you're focused on, you know, uh, you're sort of robbed of certain things when you are yeah. in them. You know, um, I, I feel like the first time I saw Night of the Comet, there must have been a screening, but I went to watch it in a theater, in a local theater in Westwood. And just to see, so sort of sit there and see what the audience reaction was. First of all, it was probably the middle of the day because I used to go to movies in the middle of the day. It, it, so the theater wasn't very full. And literally some people got up and left. Oh, geez. You know, they were like, this is not what I expected. I mean, maybe they expected a horror movie, which, which 
makes a night of the comet so great is that it's got all these elements you know even when we were shooting the producers were like should we make a horror movie or or you know stay true to what tom everhart's ver- uh, vision of it was which is much more kind of tongue in cheek yeah. you know how would two teenage girls react to the end of the world basically and uh, he's got great stories oh you would love tom oh he i love his stuff yeah he's the, the, you he is a great interview oh i'd love to he, to talk to him yeah uh, just the his his um <laughs> his filmography is just so fascinating uh yeah he yeah. has great stories about when he came up with this idea he loves these kind of apocalyptic sort of genre movies and he was he was trying to figure out what to do a, a, for an end of the world story. And he thought, what if it was just two teenage girls? So he interviewed a couple of teenage girls and he, he says that, you know, as opposed to going, oh my God, what? The end of the world? Oh, what are we going to do? Oh no. It was like, fantastic. <laughs> awesome. You mean our, pa- our parents aren't around? You know, to tell us what to do and let that, well, what would we do? We got it. And they came up with all these ideas, which he thought was fantastic and uh, created Night of the Comet from that. Um, but again, that's what makes it unique and interesting as opposed to like a horror zombie movie. It, it's about these characters, you know, it's character driven. It's yep. like delving into the brains of a couple of teenage girls who are like bored basically. <laughs> yeah, it's like a wish fulfillment, which I think a lot of that stuff has come now. And and you got mm-hmm. to work with Mary Warrenov, who also fascinates yes. me. I mean it's a real character. <laughs> she's the character, yeah, she really, really is. She's she's great. She's she, what an interesting life she's led. I remember e- seeing Eating Raul. Yes. Which and, I love. Uh, oh, two people yeah. from Eating Raul are in the yes. Exactly. And and when they were cast in the Robert Beltran, and for those who don't know, when they were cast, I was like, okay, that was a weird movie. Yes. What are these guys going to be like? <laughs> well, Mary Warnock is very kind of to herself. And it, it, I didn't really work much with her directly. Um, Kelly did. And I know she talked to you about that, but um, she was just very stoic, sort yeah. of her character in Night of the Common. And I, as far as I can tell, and a life. lot of stuff, you yeah. know, just like, yeah, kind of impenetrable, you know. She's a still waters um, run deep kind of thing that also you're yeah. like, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apparently she's an, a terrific artist. Yeah, she paints she's now. Very, yeah. very creative. Um, and But Robert Beltran was he, he, I guess it took a lot of convincing to get him to do it, but he was lovely. What I loved about Robert Beltran was he just, he didn't try to like eat up the scenery, you know, it, it was a story about us and we were kind of like, whatever. And he just kind of came in and just did his thing. He was like butter, yeah. you know what I mean? He was so smooth and, and that's, oh, it was, it was very attractive, frankly. <laughs> you know, his eyes kind of sparkle. It's like you you have a close up of him and he's like <laughs> without like a ton of other excess stuff going on. Right. It was really fun to work. He was very cool. I liked I liked him a lot. Yeah, some people just have that thing. Like that thing they when do. you meet them and, and it's it's weird and you can't really explain it to people. There are just it's usually actors and stuff that you're like there's a thing. I don't know what it is. like you knew, especially if you meet them in person. Right. There's just and they're not trying to do it it's just yeah. like there <laughs> yeah i mean I, that's kind of a problem you know it's interesting <laughs> I, I i don't know why i thought of this but i remember years and years and years ago i was getting my hair cut at some salon in la you know and my career was just starting to take off a little bit and i was talking to this person i said yeah i'm an actress and everything and, and she kind of looked at me she says can see how you would look good on camera. I was like, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's a <laughs> I think. compliment, sort of. But it's it's interesting because frankly, there's something I think that I do look better on camera than in real life. <laughs> Go figure. I've seen both. I, mean, I, I don't know if I'd, I'd say that, but, but there, that is true. Is some people that yeah, something something transmits through a camera that does not convey in real life for some people it's it's bizarre sometimes yeah yeah, yeah. So I, re- I will never forget that thing because <laughs> fortunately i i don't take things really personally growing up with two older brothers you know they yeah. just like 
they tortured me all the time. I was just tortured. <laughs> um, so it's like, I'm not really totally, it, it's water off a duck's back for me. That's such a Hollywood compliment. Like that's the most <laughs> Hollywood compliment I've ever heard. It's just like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I was like, huh. And then I, honestly, I sort of intellectualized. I, had, I thought, oh, I think she might be right there. <laughs> That's the worst kind of backhanded compliment when you're like, they're really accurate. That was an accurate. Oh, boy. I'm hideous in your life. <laughs> Which you're not, everybody. She's not. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Actually, you know, the, when, we, the la- when I saw you in person the last time, I think we were in Indianapolis. And speaking about the Atari version of Last Starfighter, that guy yeah. had built a, a version of the game. Like it was, and it was playable. He had like yeah. made the game. <laughs> Wasn't that crazy? That yeah. Insane. That was so cool. Yeah. I know. But you know, it was like, he had the whole uh, exterior and built around just a little computer, like a laptop or something yeah, yeah. like that. I mean, I don't think it was, especially for somebody who knows how to do that kind of junk. It probably wasn't that complicated, but it was pretty cool. Oh, it was incredibly little, impressive. Yeah. Little salute, that's for sure. Yeah, I was like, well, you made the game. Um, so Sunday you were saying World of Disney. Uh, Any, what else popped out at you? You were saying uh, yeah. there's some Canadian stuff that you're like, oh, my heart. <laughs> oh, my heart, I know. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Well, Sunday, definitely World of Disney was huge. And also, like, the beachcombers. That's a classic Canadian. Do you, are you familiar with the beachcombers? I've seen a few episodes. I'm more familiar with King of Kensington, which is on at 8 on Sunday. But beachcombers, I've I've seen a little bit of, and it's kind of impenetrable to me. <laughs> well, yeah. And and because it's so Canadian. I mean, it didn't go in. I, nobody else would buy it, I'm sure. In, in the States, I'm sure people would go, what is this? <laughs> yeah. But like Molly's Reach, all these um, iconic areas and places in British Columbia that they talk about and they create these characters around this small community of beachcombers. And somehow the stories are built on who can grab most of the logs on the beach illegally right. you know and then all the chaos that ensues and it's like wow that is weird but you know we my my parents like that show and so we were exposed to that show a lot and you really got into it off of vancouver there's all these islands and you take ferries from place to place and my parents live on this small island called cortez island north of vancouver off of vancouver island so to get there it's this kind of tapestry of ferry rides <laughs> But I have friends kind of in different places uh, along the way from Vancouver and back. And I would visit my friend and uh, to catch this small local ferry, you'd have to go through Molly's Reach. And I would stop and take selfies. <laughs> I mean, this is like last year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not, it's not because it was such an icon. It went on forever. It was, it, it was a very long running series and, very Canadian, but we loved it. Bruno Gerussi, the lead guy, I believe it or not, thought he was really good looking. He's confident <laughs> and good is, at his job. <laughs> right. That's what it is. Confident and good at his job. Because of the Canadian content laws that the government had, where you had to have a certain amount of content that was Canadian, when they did make content it's very canadian like they wanted to make sure you knew this was canadian content this is just a shot here with canadian cast and crew this is about a place in like this is very canadian which is why even like you know king of kensington is a specific place in toronto and you know beachcombers is a specific place like it was very much a specific place right the cbc like controls your well the the uh tele oh it's like tele canada or something it's yeah it's a government agency that sort of uh oversees the stuff oh god this is terrible but i can't <laughs> remember this but but there is a government agency that controls the film industry in canada specifically and most canadian productions feel you don't have to go through them telefilm i think it's telefilm called. yeah you you don't have to go through them but so many productions depend on grants from Telefilm Canada. And so it's sort of de rigueur to go through them. But then they have so much control over the content. And a lot of, uh, especially Canadian films, 
are very massively <laughs> almost too much Canadian content. <laughs> and a lot of American stuff is shot up there nowadays. And I think the rules actually have become even tighter for foreign productions coming up to shoot in Canada. They they get a lot of subsidies, and but they have to have some a, a certain amount of Canadian content. Like the second lead has to be Canadian. The production crew and whatnot have to be Canadian. And you'll see often in the, <laughs> these American shows, a Canadian flag yeah. flying in the background. You know, it's like, oh, geez. Um, but, uh, I, you know, there's just, so there's just not a lot of independent filmmaking in Canada, the, the way there is in the U S and I'm not sure if that's good. You know, I think it, 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 I shouldn't be critical of my home country, but I feel <laughs> like it, 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 it's, it's, it stifles it stuff them, a little bit. It stifles them a little, it keeps them boxed in a little bit because, you know, I don't know that a government institution should control the entire industry in, in Canada. Um, but, you know, you could say the same here, like all the big production companies or studios are now controlled by businessmen, which right. you could argue is the is the same. They just want to make as much money as, you, as they can, as opposed to, ooh, let's get really super creative, you right. know. So, um, cause you've anyway. worked in all those models. Like that's the sort of interesting perspective that you have mm-hmm. is, yeah. you know, working for literally for Menachem Golan, mm-hmm. <laughs> not even just his yeah. company, but literally for him, who was a character right. himself. Um, you know, yes. which was a mini, they called them a mini major at one point, but they were certainly independent, um, in independent yeah. studios and major television networks and every sort of iteration of those businesses, as you can imagine. So yeah. you have this perspective over sort of what works best or right. what works. Right. Well, yeah. And again, I've been criticized for being critical about <laughs> uh, Canadian um, content and whatnot. You know, the, I, I think that um, Powderheads actually was completely independent. of <laughs> Not that it made it a better film. <laughs> you mean, me. you mean t- telefilm didn't have a huge no, role yeah, in that film? I don't film? think so. <laughs> I'm um, but yeah, it would be uh, it would be great to see more real in the, because there's so much talent in Canada, and certainly there's because there's so much American um, filming going on up in Canada. They they have the crews and, and the locations, everything is set up and directors and DPs and all that other stuff. It'd be great if there was a lot more independent um, filmmaking, I, I feel like, but have you, you seen, know. there's a Canadian show called still standing. Have you seen it? It's no, it's so it's, it's streaming on Amazon prime here. And I, I someone recommended it to me cause I'm a stand up, and it's, it's, it's a docu, right. it's a docu series basically, but this stand up comic is traveling to all the, these sort of dead industrial towns in Canada <laughs> and cool. doing a new stand up show for the whole town in like a week. So, it, but it, like it's all about the town. So, it's kind of like a docu travel series oh, and then cool. a stand up show. But I've loved it because it's been, yeah. you know, it's, it's all these places I've never heard of or, you know, sort of strange provinces or these very, very, regional things. And, yeah. um, you know, that kind of stuff I love because it's not, it, it had to be done there. <laughs> it's right. not pretending to sort of be a different place with, you know, a flag in the background or whatever it is. And, uh, <laughs> right. You know, that stuff's fascinating to me. Um, yeah. That sounds really interesting. Actually, I'll have to look for that one. It's it's very good. It's I've heard of it, but I haven't, I haven't seen it. It's pretty easy to yeah, find. That's... So it's good. Um, yeah. So you, but you do have this love for them because you watched them when you were growing up, these sort of very Canadian shows. Oh yeah. Like, oh, I, I, you know, I was writing down a couple of the, things that really stand out in my mind are some of the children's shows that I was allowed to watch when I was little, like um, Mr. Dress Up, which was our version of Mr. Uh, uh, Rogers' Neighborhood. Okay. (laughs) Exactly the same thing. Puppets, same thing. And he would get dressed up in different things and play these different characters, but basically exactly the same thing. But it was called Mr. Dress Up. I never saw Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood until I came to the States. I didn't know what that was. Um, we had a, a thing called, so funny, somebody posted it, I think, on Facebook called The Friendly Giant, okay. which was, uh, I just love this show. It was literally about 15 minutes long, each of the shows. <laughs> this is how old I am. There was still 15 minutes. 
um, it, it was about this giant who uh, would invite you over to his castle and he'd let down the drawbridge for you to walk in. And then it would, it would uh, cut to in front of a big roaring fire and his giant hand would come down and he'd say, here's a rocking chair for one of you to rock. Here's the other comfy chair. And here's one for two to curl up in and then look up. And his hand would be like this, <laughs> look up way up and he'd follow up his arm and there he was the friendly giant and he was standing by a window in his castle and oddly he had uh rusty the rooster was in this bag and he opened oh rusty are you in there and rusty was like the the size of a chicken that a giant would right. have it's like a giant, giant. it wasn't a little itty tiny but yeah it was giant chicken and and he would he played all sorts of very talented chicken. And then there was a Jerome the giraffe who would peek his head in the, the window. And they were puppets. And, and they it, I watched this one that was posted. And it was fantastic. It was He was describing different kinds of classical music. And they would play these, this music. And he played the recorder. And, um, and Rusty would play the violin or the harp. And then Jerome would just like move in the background, <laughs> his, his neck and his head bouncing around and they would talk about it. And oh, the friendly giant was just so friendly. And I loved the part where he would invite you in and you picture which chair you'd like to sit in. Sounds like it a meditation app. Like, like I'm able to it, use this now to just kind of like chill out. <laughs> it was the best. I, I just love this show. And, and then and a third one I was thinking of, which was local in Edmonton called Popcorn Playhouse, where they would have just little kids sitting on these benches and they would play Popeye cartoons, which I loved. And then the most special part of the show was uh, you, you drew numbers or something like that to dig into a gold mine, which was just a box full of sand. And you got to dig once with this little shovel and then put it through like a sieve. And there might be like a gold coin in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like a little, obviously wrapped in gold tinfoil right, right. or something like that. And then, you know, it's 25 cents or 10 cents. But that happened maybe 50% of the time. But it was always like, oh, are they going to get something? Get? And then they, they wouldn't and be like, oh. Oh, no. It would be like torture for the kid. I think my brother got to go on Popcorn Playhouse. I didn't. <laughs> Did you see anyway. him on it or was it before you were sort of... Um, I must have seen him on it. I must have. I think he got to go on for his birthday or something. But yeah, that was that was like a dream if we could go on Popcorn Playhouse. Um, yeah, but yeah, this others. Let's see what else we got going here. I mean, there's Rhoda. That was Sunday, and the Hardy Boys. I liked because I I really thought um, uh, Parker Stevenson was pretty cute. Oh, I liked wow. it a lot. you weren't a Sean Cassidy. You were Parker Stevenson. I was a Parker Stevenson ga gal. You know, I didn't like those pretty faces. <laughs> I like the, and, and amazingly, when I, I was very new in Hollywood, I think my agent or something set me up on a date with him. Oh, wow. I, yeah. And he took me to some, uh, I don't know, some garden or something like that. And we kind of walked through there. But he had no interest. There was zero interest there. <laughs> that was the last time I saw him. But I was like, oh, God. It's a hardy boy. Like, it's a hardy boy. I was probably stunned into silence. You know, I did, just didn't even know what to do. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing with this person? And why is he with me? Oh, that, me. It's very surreal. I imagine you're like, how did this happen? It was very surreal. I, I was totally not cool at all. <laughs> World of Disney. All in the family was classic, of course. Yeah. Was there a show that you watched when you were growing up that you felt really was like you're, the United States is going to be like that. And then you got here and it was, it lived up to it or was totally different or like what you thought New York or LA would be like based on something. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure that I thought I really loved cowboy stuff. So I was really anxious to get to like Arizona or New Mexico or something. And they actually turned out to be exactly yeah. what they were. I, I loved California too, because of the, um, you know, the desert, there were so many things shot in California for the desert, which it is, um, you know, 
classic, classic things. And I got an opportunity to shoot on some of those locations, which is so incredibly cool. I think um, I, I remember it, it's weird because I remember this series that I shot, a spelling series that I shot. Um, we shot in Vegas. It's called, it was called Hearts Are Wild, and it was literally a Vegas version of the love boat. So, you know, there was the staff, and, and we'd invite all these famous guests in for an appearance on an episode. And um, But my thought about Vegas was, this is exactly what I thought it would be <laughs> yeah. like. It's yeah. just like, to me, it was like, oh my God, this is so gross. <laughs> we literally lived in, the, in Caesar's Palace. Oh, God. <laughs> I, you know, we'd have our rooms and the beds were round, and, <laughs> which is a really not a very practical bed. And um, there were mirrors on the ceiling <laughs> so and a bathtub next to the bed. It's like, ew. This room is um, not for sleeping. It really was not designed for a good night's sleep. <laughs> and New York scared the crap out of me. I mean, it just, uh, the first time I was in New York, was weekend at Bernie's, I think. Oh, wow. I had a friend who let me stay in his apartment on the Upper East Side, which was great, but I was scared of everything. I was scared to go outside. I remember a friend of mine was passing through and he had like a, a few hours layover at LaGuardia or something like that. So I hailed a cab and I'm in the back going, I don't know where LaGuardia is. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to LaGuardia. Yeah. Um, the, I don't know, United place. Um, and he, he, so he's driving away. And so looking at the review, <laughs> going, so where are you from? <laughs> and like, I'm from Canada. I, I grew up in Edmonton. Are you familiar? And he probably said something. Oh, I have some relatives over here. Anyway, the drive to LaGuardia took about two hours. Yep. I, I I literally remember looking out the window one time going, that looks very familiar to me. <laughs> I think he sort of drove around Manhattan Island a couple of times. And then eventually I got there. And of course, it was very expensive. Um, at the time, it was probably something like 50 bucks, which was a lot at that yeah, time, oh yeah. 75 or something. And I was just like, I knew I'd been taken, you know, and I was just like, threw the money at him. <laughs> I'm like, Arr! you know, the character BB and um, the apple, that was me. And, <laughs> and basically, I, I, I was BB. I was, and I still basically, I'm the most gullible person for me. It's a naivete. It's not gullible. Yes, yeah, naivete. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> you, you get cast as like, as, as ver I mean, aside for the apple, as, as for sort of confident characters, though, who are like, the least gullible person in a thing. <laughs> You're like the voice of reason. A lot of times in a movie, you'll yeah. be like, you guys are falling for this. <laughs> yeah. You think? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. I mean, that. well, of course that's the great thing about acting is hopefully you get to play all these different characters. I mean, like, it, I mean, in the last Starfighter, I was basically the girl next door, which was pretty classic. And in days of our lives, of course, Kayla Brady nurse, you know, Vir I lost my virginity on Days of Our Lives. Oh, <laughs> that's the place to lose it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Chris Kosicek, the guy, Josh Taylor, who played Chris Kosicek, playing my boyfriend at that time, then became, now, he's still on the show. He's now my brother. Oh. Roman. Very mm -hmm. odd, yeah. So I, Yeah. <laughs> that's a whole Freudian thing right there. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. He now plays my brother on there, Roman Brady. But um, uh, but then when I got to like Night of the Comet, one of the things, of course, that attracted me to Night of the Comet was the fact that Reggie was kind of a tough nut, you know, which it, it, I mean, absolutely. I'm naive and I'm gullible and, or night have this incredible naivete, <laughs> but, um, but, Growing up, really, I was more of a tomboy any, anyway. Yeah. So that was something that attracted me to the character as well as a, just having some sort of a departure from this girl next door kind sure. of thing. 
<laughs> which was also mischief you were a similar character there was kind of girl next story in that movie yeah as well. um yeah but then like like dudes is a movie where you get to be I in know. a western basically because that is a western <laughs> it's for all intents and purposes a western and it, it is you know i love that it's a great movie that movie is you know, I was talking to Penelope about that when we was on, and she's like, "No one ever mentions dudes or has seen dudes." And I think it's great. That I love that movie. I love that character because also growing up, one of my passions was horses. I never got to have a horse, but boy, I knew everything about a horse. I would go to like Pioneer Ranch Camp in the summer and things like that. And um, so, being able to play that character and ride those horses and shoot those guns was like a fantasy come true for me. I mean, truly like uh, uh, as an actor, you get to live vicariously through these characters. Another one was scenes from the gold mine, which where I got to play a musician, you know, a rock and roll musician. Did you ever see that one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very eighties. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I look at the, the fashion in that. I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> it was but appropriate God, at the time. It was appropriate at the time. And what fun was that being able to sit on stage singing um so much fun the, the most recent thing i could because growing up we used to just sing in our house just out loud belting out songs my brothers and i did my parents not so much but we did and i remember having friends over and they would be like it was like why are <laughs> your brothers like singing at the top of their lungs off key and I'm like you don't do that in your house? We do. Um, yeah. I would used to come home from high school and put on a record if I wasn't watching soap operas. <laughs> For 10 minutes. And just, yeah. And just learn record albums from cover to cover. One of the first ones was um, The Beatles' Abbey Road. When I discovered that in my dad's record collection, well, that one got worn out, man. And I would just just sing at the top of my lungs in my living room. Um, so being able to do that, you know, and act at the same time was like a fantasy. Uh, yeah. So that was fun. The last thing I, I did actually before the pandemic, well, not the absolute last thing before the pandemic, but one of the, a TV movie called rock and a rock and roll Christmas. Oh, yeah, You've done it's a few a, Christmas movies recently. Right? Yeah, I have. Yeah. <laughs> um, I played the mother in a mother-daughter singing duo and we kind of make a comeback um but we got to perform on stage and record a couple of songs and it was oh, just being on stage again i would just i just was i felt home and i had i loved it and being able to sing was really super fun too yeah because yeah. you didn't get to do your own singing for the apple mm. no yeah, yeah. So. that was that was and rightfully so, ultimately, because the rest of the cast, George Gilmore and uh, everybody, Alan Love, um, Grace Kennedy, they were all real singers, professional singers, you know. Um, Grace Kennedy had the most amazing voice. And I was just this kid, you know, I was taking singing lessons in my school and things like that, but I just didn't have the chops. They actually did set me up with a, a coach. For a while, but they ultimately decided this this fantastic singer called Mary Hyland ended up doing the vocals. So I, you know, overdubbed it or whatever. But and I think that I think her voice matched mine really. It does really seem well. very similar, yeah. And especially hearing roles where you've gotten to sing, uh, you know, yeah. it, it kind of does fit pretty accurately. <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah, which is kind of cool, yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was great. She was fantastic. Is there anything you've been, because uh, I don't want to take up your whole afternoon because I will. Uh, is there <laughs> anything that you've been watching? We've only gotten to Sunday. <laughs> I know, I know. We could. Uh, um, is there anything you've been watching in lockdown or any like like comfort shows that you've revisited uh, while we've been inside or anything that you've really just kind of gravitated <laughs> towards? Oh, let's see. I, it, I'm embarrassed in some ways because I, I love... <laughs> My husband hates this show, but I it's it's a sort of a guilty pleasure of mine is this is us. I just love it. I love this is us. I love those kind of things. Um we've been watching, you know, we just finished Bridgerton, which is very popular. We I love the crown. Oh, I think that's so great. I love um 
I really, really enjoy foreign programming. I, I find it, it just I, I, more, it has more texture somehow, you know, I, I don't know. It maybe, I don't know. There's one, a French one called call my agent, which is really great. It's fantastic, but you, it's subtitled. You can actually put, apparently you can somehow figure it out. We're not the most technical family or duo our kids are, but <laughs> you can actually have it overdubbed in English, but we, we do the subtitles. Um, yeah. There's some terrific stuff on, on Netflix and we try to find, something that we're, we're, we both liked. He loves kind of revenge things and good guy and bad guy and the good guy wins. And, and I'm more of the, this is us. Right. Kind of right. A pulling at the heartstrings, uh, family yeah. drama. Yeah. Yeah. But we have, we'll, you know, at night we'll sit down and watch, uh, um, one of those kind of things. He enjoys those as well. There's, yeah, there's, there's some terrific, Oh my gosh, some terrific programming on, on, uh, on Netflix. It's a little overwhelming for me, frankly. Um, I, I, you know, people always ask me, what am I watching? Or have you seen this? And inevitably, 90% of the time I haven't because there's just so much. I don't know how to navigate it very well. Yeah, it's you know, hard. I grew up like this, where there's four channels and, and that's it, you yeah. know? Yeah, if you had to, if you had a choice, you probably wouldn't have watched Man from Atlantis on Tuesday night. But well, here's here's the thing, by the way, that it's funny you say that because I I watched Man, I, I saw Man from Atlantis, and I saw that Anthony James was on it, mm-hmm. and on the same show, Cheryl Farrell, Sharon Farrell, yes, who was stepmom, or I don't know if they were actually married, but our guardian on night of the comet. She was so funny. And Anthony James was in world gone wild. Um, and he and I became very good. For, he, I have a painting of his, he passed away a few years ago. So, so sadly, I hadn't seen him for a long time, but um, I have a book of his poems. He wrote a, a, a terrific book called acting my face. He has this incredible history um, raised by his m- mother, a Greek uh, uh, immigrant, you know, basically in poverty. And he got into acting as this incredible character actor with a, a, an amazing history. But anyway, he was in um, he was in World Gone Wild with me, along with Bruce Stern, yep. who's also <laughs> incredible, and Michael Pere. Um, but he was, I saw that he was on it. Yeah, and this like, week's I episode, had, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I have to find it. And I did. I found it on YouTube. I bought it on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, Patrick Duffy's stars as this Aquaman. It was just awful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but Sharon Farrell was terrific. Yep. She was very Sharon farrell And he was also fantastic. I mean, I'm so glad I watched it. <laughs> it's a fun episode. It's That show is wonderfully terrible. And it was, you know, it was Patrick Duffy coming off Dallas. They were like, he can do anything he wants. <laughs> is that right? That was after it, Dallas? Oh, no, it was, dur- it was around when he was on I think he had done a couple episodes of it, um, okay. but they were like, he, this is going to be the biggest thing on the, in the world. This show, they put a ton of money into it uh, and okay. it's terrible, but this one is weird. They're at a carnival and Billy Barty's in it, which is always kind of fun to see Billy Barty pop up. Uh, so of all the episodes to watch, this is probably the one to watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I really felt sorry for Patrick Duffy. I hate doing stuff in, in water yeah. because I, I get so cold and here he is. He has to sit in water, pretend that he can breathe mm-hmm. without any bubbles. And they would have these close-ups of his eyes with these green contacts in. And they were just like <laughs> bloodshot. Oh, yeah. I mean, he it must have been torture. It must have been torture. And I was thinking as I was watching it, because sometimes he had these bright green contacts in and sometimes he didn't. And so I thought, oh, for sure, he was like, if I don't have to wear these stupid things, Take them out of my eyes because they were giant. Yeah, too. those scurril <laughs> lenses—they were glass, so they really oh, hurt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Back in the day, right? It was so funny, but I really wanted to. See, and I'd never—I don't recall ever seeing it before. 
but it was really fun to see Anthony and Cheryl and yeah. That's um, so funny. Oh that you, it, it inspired you to actually purchase an episode. I had to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had to see my friends. <laughs> but you know what was was also cool? I don't know if I'm going up or down. I think I'm okay. June third, Saturday. Oh, this was a this was a nice ad that I highlighted because <laughs> it's it's for Vanguard trailer homes yes. or whatever you call them. Vanguard designers work very hard to ensure that the lady of the house doesn't have to. You know, cleaning the lady the of the house doesn't have to clean the bathroom. I'm like, oh my God, hopefully times have changed. Soil oh. resistant fabrics and wax free yeah. linoleum. Yeah, it's that is horrific. And the it's the drawing, so sexist. Oh, but. absolutely. It was only recently that I've seen them where it's not a woman doing the cleaning. <laughs> I know. And and Yes, only recently. And then they, I feel like they've sort of gone off that also because the reality is guys don't care about that. No, that's true. <laughs> Although I, I did get a cordless Dyson recently and it is kind did of you? the best thing I've ever gotten. Like it's, did you? it's amazing. It's like, Indeed. I'm just vacuuming things for fun now. <laughs> oh boy. Can you come over to my house? Yeah, I'll come down. Because down, down. this thing is, it's a good time. Is it? <laughs> Yeah, we have this. I I I have a Mila, which I am sold on. I, I I don't know Dyson. Everybody says that about Dyson, but um, I find them really loud. Are they really super loud? This one is like pretty quiet because it's like a handheld little okay. one. And the only thing that I don't like about it is the battery doesn't stay charged for that. Oh, uh, there you go. Um, yeah. But I discovered there's this like whole weird world of people who make like modifications for Dyson's. Like, You're kidding like, me. So that people make like long life battery packs and like special extensions and like all this <laughs> like non-sanctioned stuff. You can like suit this thing up. <laughs> in the black market. Yeah. In the Dyson black market. You too. It's like hot those. rods. For those <laughs> things. Oh my God. That's pretty funny. Sort of, yeah. It kind of defeats the purpose in a way if you have to do all that stuff. But whatever. Pretty yeah, much. Man, let us. Uh, one of my favorite movies was on uh, June 6th, Tuesday at 9, um, National Velvet. Of horses. Love that movie. <laughs> horses, exactly. I have a, a script that I've been writing since I was 12. Oh, wow. <laughs> I started it in the back of a, of a camper van in New Zealand. This is, this is during our uh, sabbatical year where we just went all over the world including New Zealand. And we were just driving around this incredibly beautiful place. And I was bored. So I started writing a story about a horse because I loved horses and a little girl and a horse. And I'm still writing it to this day. One day it's going to be made into a movie, but partly inspired by, I call, uh, it's called Pie, okay. based on National Velvet. That's the name of the um, horse. It was, mm, yeah. And Elizabeth Taylor is Part 12 in National Velvet. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, yeah. I love all that stuff. I'm, I'm just going through because yeah, yeah. there's a lot, you know, Bob Newhart, obviously, was a classic. We always watch Bob Newhart. Um, I love the Waltons. And mostly I like the ending of the, I, I also have this idea of the idyllic lifestyle that the Waltons portrayed to me, that kind of turn of the century poor farm person. I like I like that sort of stuff for some reason. Well, cause it's oh, simple. I, it's simple. And it's, it's, um, yeah. like it's, it's easy to be, seems easy to be happy, I guess. I know you didn't require a lot of junk. Yeah. I find, I, I, I find myself thinking these days about when, and if I ever retire that I can finally just go offline <laughs> and just move somewhere and grow some vegetables have a horse <laughs> yep. you know a totally off the grid you're gonna go yeah yeah yeah. maybe get yourself a camper van that's really easy to clean <laughs> right yeah i wonder where i could find one of those oh, maybe i wonder if they still still make them and then, you well so this was kind of iconic the ken norton larry holmes fight oh yeah on, on uh what, what day was this i them uh, june 9th which was a, a a historic fight, right? Yeah, this was huge. This was, uh, I think, Larry Holmes lost this fight, and he was he unbeaten did. before that. He was like undefeated, he, right? Um, I, I watched like the fifteenth round, and it was 
unbelievable. These men just pounding the crap out of each other. And I guess it was, uh, well, so Norton was, is younger, right? Yeah. Holmes? Yeah. yeah. Younger. Uh, um, Larry Holmes would just smash him in the face and he didn't budge. I mean, yeah. he, it, it was just like, they were both exhausted by this time and it was really up in the air who would win. But uh, Larry Holmes was really starting to look tired. And Ken Norton was just like solid, man. Yeah. I was like, what are in those neck muscles of his that his head barely bounced? It was, I just thought that I, when I saw that, I was like, wait a minute, wasn't this a hugely famous um, match. Yeah. And this so gets I, overlooked a lot because I think that, you know, the, the big ones people will talk about is like George Foreman and Muhammad Ali, but like Larry Holmes and, and Norton were, were not, not, not unfamous boxers and right. boxing was massive. Like this is sort of prime time on a Friday. Uh, right, 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 right. There was another one with Sugar Ray Leonard, which was pretty funny. Cause I've met him. He's such, he's, he's not that big, right? Yeah, he's Sugar fast Ray Leonard, though. Yeah. He was fast. fast. He was the fast guy. And he was, he was so pretty and stuff. Yeah. He tried to get into acting and junk like that. I think I must've done something with him. You know, maybe he was on the uh, hearts. <laughs> that makes sense. He'd be a good guest star. Uh, yeah, yeah, the funniest exactly. thing about this one, there's an amazing, quote in this little piece sidebar uh from norton because he he was the champion but he only became the champion because leon sphinx refused to defend his title against him so they stripped sphinx of his title and gave it to norton and people used to call him a paper champion which really oh, bothered no. him but uh he says, says norton has been uncharacteristically blunt about his game plan tonight quote i never wanted to hurt anyone in the ring before but I plan on hurting Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did. He certainly he did. did. Yeah. 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 That's, that's very, yeah. You know, as a boxer, you try not to hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but this evening I plan on hurting Holmes. Right. And, just, just now, just yeah, once. <laughs> I decided, and this is live from Vegas. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I thought that was, I just, I was, that just struck me. I mean, I didn't watch a lot of boxing, but I noticed in the same week, Sugar Ray Leonard had a match and then these guys, which is just incredible. Um, so uh, if we move on, by the way, yeah. there's, this is another one that was sort of uh, dear to our Canadian hearts. Uh, it was called Reach for the Top. And it's sort of like, um, how can you compare it to? I know that they have, but they're high schools. I know they have something here in the States that's the same, but I forget what it's called. I was going to say Jeopardy, but it's not like Jeopardy. It's like high school students from two different schools. There's like four of them on each team. And it's, it's you know, they're Trivia. asked all these Yeah, it's like university Trivia challenge or... kind of thing. Yeah. Right. I'm sure there's something here that's that's similar, but I forget what it is now. But again, my brother who got to go on Popcorn Playhouse, he got to go on Reach for the Top. But then again, he was really super smart. So, did they win? Did his team win, though? They did not. Ah, they did not. Reach for the Top was famously parodied on SCTV as a high Q. <laughs> they do. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There, Maybe that's what I'm thinking about. Maybe that's what I'm thinking about. But uh, yeah, he was on that, and which was very, very exciting. You know, we all watched and everything. And then... But there's also something about the pressure of being on camera that you kind of, you know, he, he, my brother has a photographic memory Wow. and he, uh, he, 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 I remember all the poor expression. We would, we didn't have a video camera in our home or of course you'd never recorded anything off a of television. There was no such thing as VHS or anything like that. Um, but we have these pictures. My dad would take pictures of the show. <laughs> There's one of him just like, oh, he was so mad at himself because he said the wrong answer, and but he knew it was the wrong answer. Anyway, they they uh, I don't believe they won that. But, but that you, was you have a photo of him failing. <laughs> Fail. I know. Isn't it terrible? It's horrible. Yeah, he's a, he's he's no dummy. But yeah, it was. Uh, it was uh, something he. Uh, was there a thing? Uh, that, was there a thing that you did that your parents were like the thing they were most impressed by? Like most people I know, like they they will get a couple mm -hmm. things and their parents are like, oh, that's kind of cool, you know. And this isn't a career yet, but yeah. then they'll get something weird that for some reason their parents are like, wow, I'm really impressed now. <laughs> 
No, I never got the wow. I'm really <laughs> impressed now. <laughs> yeah, well, that would have been nice, but <laughs> um, I remember my dad. It, like a compliment for my dad would have been that was very satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> Which most people sort of go, that's it. <laughs> but that was a big compliment for him. But he, I did this small movie in Canada called Cafe Romeo, and. He said to me, he goes, I like that movie. Wow. Which to me was like, wow, you made it now. So that was nice. But that was, from what I recall, that was uh, the only time. <laughs> At least you had that you one. Know, I know. <laughs> yeah. you, didn't want, you didn't want it to go to my head or anything well, yeah, like you don't, that. Yeah, you don't want to have a big ego. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but they were supportive. They were. It's yeah. like... Uh, I, uh, it's funny you ask that because I, I know that Jim Beaver was saying the same thing about his parents and everything. And when his father passed away, both my parent, my dad just passed away in December, sadly. Oh, and um, when we were cleaning out my parents' house, my job was to go through all the you know VHS tapes and beta. There was a couple of betas in there. <laughs> of course. And so some DVDs. And, um, you know, they weren't that verbal about how proud they were of me, but they had everything. Yep, they always do. They had everything. So, I mean, you know, that's one of the reasons probably I like to watch things just by myself because it's really tough when you you watch something that you're on and then everybody just sort of silently leaves. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's like... Anyway, okay. Well, I, I, I put a lot been. of work into this. No, oh, damn. But, you know, I, there was a thing about um, e- ego, for sure. They didn't want it to. When I was a little kid, really young, really young, like three years old, I remember visiting my grandparents at their cabin in Quebec at this place called Holiday Hill. They had a like a cottage. And um, I don't really remember a whole lot about it. I was only like three. But apparently, I was looking at myself in the mirror too much as far as my mother was concerned. So she covered all the mirrors. Oh, that's extreme. That's a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see where that's coming from. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, So, yeah, it was extreme. But, you know, old school, I have to say. there. It's, it's a different generation, for yep. sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, there was not a lot of, oh, I love you so much and you're so fantastic all right. the time. <laughs> right, Or even like, oh, you're working with this person. They're a big star. Mm. Can you can you get me there? They probably, yeah, right. No, never no. that. But they were probably be more like, how the hell is she working with that person? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> she gets that. I think my career was sort of a mystery to my <laughs> Well, luckily, they didn't have to understand it for it to be a, a successful career. <laughs> right. And it, it helped to, you know, be in L.A. And all that they did, they visited me on the set of Mischief, which was kind of cool. It was fun to have them there. And I, I, you know, obviously they were proud. My dad, is, you know, he, especially towards the end of his life, he understood my brothers and their academia. He, he got that. Yeah, that's his um, world. That's his world. But he made sure I knew that he was proud of all three of us equally. Yeah. Very, he made sure I knew that. So that was, that's very nice. That's yeah, very nice. That's cool. And, and of yeah. all the sets to visit, Mischief would have been the cool one because at, at a minimum, cool cars. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, that was, that was super fun because I think it, they, the 50s were portrayed pretty authentically in that one. Um, and yeah, they, one thing they did say to me is um, that people on the set, the director or whatever producer would say that uh, I was a real hard worker and they, they really like working with me and things like that. And I think they said something to me about that, that they were proud of that part. So that's good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, you know, with the background of, of, as a dancer, it really prepares you to work Hard. Yeah. There's nothing that takes more discipline than, especially in a company, in a group working 
together to produce uh, a, a, whatever, a, a piece, a dance piece. Uh, it's an incredible amount of work and dedication and um, discipline. Yeah. And team effort, to your point. Like that's movies, television, they fail when you get somebody who is not a team player. And everybody oh, should sure. be working in sync on those things. Like I always say, you know, like a movie being good is almost despite everything going like it's it's yeah. hard to make a really good thing. Uh whereas right. you can take something really good and it's very easy for it to fall apart a million but, times yeah. along the way. <laughs> right. And and yeah, it's it, it is it's interesting. It's very much a trickle down situation on a set. The director generally sets the tone. Um and and also the lead actors, absolutely. Um, and it's a drag when you have someone involved that really is an asshole. Yeah. No, no. There's <laughs> or takes it for granted, or 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 looks down on you. Yep. Or I've worked with people that I just wasn't good enough for them. Yeah. And it's like, how are we to create the best work we possibly can if we're not? in sync, you know, if we're not doing this, we're so lucky to be in this business in the first place. I mean, people, you know, spend their lives just trying to get a line in a movie. And here we are working away in this incredible industry that is such a wonderful creative outlet and so challenging. And, you know, the, 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 the audience, loves you and and they're the only reason you're here and you have contempt you, you for them have contempt for them or have contempt for a fellow actor who you feel like isn't as good as right. you are or something like that that happens not all the time but it does happen and it's a bit of a drag and inexcusable frankly it really is and it's what it's it's sort of the only industry maybe like some finance industry still but like kind of the only <laughs> industry where it's still kind of okay to be like that like you could still get away with it. Not as much as you could before, but like mm. any other job, if you acted right. like that towards your coworkers, they'd be like, yeah, you're fired. I'm sorry. But it's one right. of the few things where they're like, well, yeah, but it's them. You know, it's like, it's yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, they, they depend on some of these people to market their, you know, film or whatever. And so they'll hire somebody in spite of the fact that they know, that they're going to be a pain in the ass yeah. and that's too, it's too bad, but it's all about money. Of course, oh, yeah. you know, ultimately well, yeah. as most things are, but I will say luckily, you know, in the years I've been doing stand up, and the years I've been doing the show and all the people I've gotten to meet, almost everybody has been just the nicest, most normal mm. down to earth person. And yeah. I've learned that acting is such a blue collar business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, the, the, the heights of it to your point where you're saying like, it's this amazing world, but still like the, the grind of it is, is mm. so blue collar that most mm -hmm. people are kind of look at it that way. And you know, the people who are in it and it, and it's uh, it's nice to know that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's a very humbling industry Certainly. as well, as you know, I mean, it's such a roller coaster, you know, uh, a, 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 you really have to, to fight, to stay in the, stay in the game. Um, uh, it was really interesting. I was really enjoying, I would, it was Scott Valentine. I yep. was loving his interview because he's, he's like one of the nicest people ever. We've done two things together. We did a play and we did a TV movie and, um, just such a lovely guy. And of course he was on that, the show, um, what was the show called? oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Family ties, um, for so long and, and really established himself on that show. And then, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you're not hip and young and all that other stuff anymore. And you're, you're, you're wanting to play different characters and nobody will see you that way. And it's, it's just, it's really humbling. It's yeah. torture. I mean, you have to be almost a, a masochist to be in this business. 90% of the auditions that you do you don't even get any feedback and you pour right. your heart and soul into things and now everything is remote it's all self-tape you can't even be in front of a human being right i don't know what they do are they looking at a thumbnail on their phone to see who 
they're going to cast. It's really, it was so much fun in the eighties, the industry. I used to love auditioning because you get to sit in the room with the people and I had a little success. So there was some respect going on. I didn't have to like grovel with the assistant of the assistant of the assistant as he was talking about for, for a a while. I mean, then, you know, um, it's like I said, it's a, it's a roller coaster, but, uh, but it was really cool going in and talking to all the people like the director and the producer and doing your read with the casting director and, and then getting some feedback. And a lot of casting was about how you got along with the people, even not necessarily, but at least in tandem with whether you're right for the role, but right. also how what your relationship with the people who are going to be making this movie is. And I love that. I was I thrived in that in that atmosphere. And now it's just like I I ugh, I I do a lot of auditions. I do a lot of self. T- I have to I I go to a, a place to do a self tape audition that I have to pay for. So now I'm paying They're for the, the privilege hole. of yeah. auditioning for for a show that they'll just they have a hundred people. And they're just going, boom, 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 boom. you know, it's, it's very, um, it's just so different. I know during this pandemic, it's necessary, but boy, I've done some auditions on zoom and that's tough for me too, because they expect you to have it all lit. Right. And you're, I've been, I've been asked like for a commercial audition, for instance, they'll say, well, okay, we want you to shoot it in your home with your husband and you have to light it and create the sound and all that junk. Because we're not going to come over there. Do it. You want me to just do the commercial? So I'm a production company now. <laughs> it's it's like really it's so weird. And I I I don't do those because first of all, I'm not going to shoot anything in my home because right. it's my home. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a whole new world, man. And and just technically, again, not an IT person doing a, a, a audition on zoom and, and <laughs> you know, it's so much oh, more. It's, it, you should only have to be concentrating on just doing a good job with the thing they're hiring you for. And when you also have to be, you know, a technical person and in part of that, obviously, yes, this is the pandemic, but stuff was moving that way before, you know, where it's, yeah. um, you know, you have to be able to be a self-contained entertainment unit in order because yeah. people don't, to your point, auditioning in the eighties where they can kind of have a vision of how this person will slot in here, how this will work, the chemistry and that sort of stuff will make, we're looking at ingredients and we can see what the final product is. A lot of the time now I get the impression that they want a final product that they can just kind of like lease. (laughs) It's It's true. I mean, I don't know that it's Twitter anymore, but it used to be like a friend of mine in LA was like, this is when, this is probably 10 years ago when I started going back to LA said, well, do you have a Twitter account? I'm like, no. Oh, you have to have a Twitter account. You have to have, they want you to have a whole bunch of Twitter followers. And now I'm sure it's TikTok or something or Instagram, but it's like, what? I have to have a whole bunch of, so they, they literally pluck these reality online kids and stick them in things because they have an automatic following. Yeah. Um, which is again, not art. No, it becomes not about the art itself and more about the making of it and, and only having the art. So you have something to promote because <laughs> the promotion is the right. thing. Now it's right. very weird. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's not much fun. Not no. for somebody in my stage at any rate, at my stage, it's like, you know, you, I really, I I'm trying to get more into um, producing and directing and writing, for instance, like I was saying, I have a, a, a script that has been optioned actually in a, at a production company in Canada that we're sort of, you know, snail's pace crawl right. towards maybe getting it possibly financed. Um, and it, but it's uh, slated for me to star in as well as direct because I just, this whole, uh, and if I had my druthers, I would just direct, I'd hire like some famous person and, and just direct it. Cause I really would love to direct uh, uh, the little bit that I've done. I just, I love, I love it. Um, 
And then there's not that responsibility of having to appear a certain way mm -hmm. or la la la, you know. And if I got to direct more, I would absolutely insist on meeting people in person or somehow figuring all that out because I just don't, I don't get this. And it just doesn't make it fun or satisfying yeah. so much anymore. It feels disjointed. It You don't get that sort of magic. You don't get an organic, like so many things you've done, whether they, whether they were hits at the time or not, like last Starfighter or something, the work itself, just based on the nature of qualities it has organically grows an audience that lasts for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because of the sort of sincerity and the, the alchemy that was there when it was being made. And Absolutely. you're sort of setting yourself up for failure now to never be able to have that just based on the way that the stuff is being generated. It's sort of disposable in a lot of ways. It's, it's, it's weird. It's, I, and I don't think anyone knows how to do it or what they're, it, everyone's kind of just <laughs> like flailing and hoping that something yeah. works. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it does feel a little disposable. It just, and, and just cranking out these giant, overwhelmingly action packed, things um it, it 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 feels like just the same thing recycled in a giant machine you know just yeah. grinding away um there's there yeah it's it's that's one of the reasons i i enjoy um you know english and french and just foreign films and things like that in general because there's a there's a an intimacy i mean i feel like when they're over you're you're thinking about it still you know it is uh or, or even you you feel a sense of being in that place you know if it's if it's a uh, set in a certain time period you know i just don't feel i, I don't really go to these superhero movies anyway but the ones that i've gone to i just don't feel anything <laughs> well, it's, it's a like, roller coaster oh. ride rather than a good meal I guess that'd be the difference where it's, it's experiential, but it doesn't stick with you. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think there's something to be said for limitations innovating. So when you have budgetary constraints or, you know, when you have limits around the ways you can tell your story, you have to do some stuff really, really good to make up for yeah, it. Or right. innovate. You have to be creative. Exactly. You have to be able, you have to be creative to, work within those confines, right. which is, you know, like Night of the Comet's a perfect example. It was like the budget of $700,000, right? And uh, I mean, the innovation in that was incredible. And the fact that in those days, you know, downtown LA, we shot around Christmas time, like first thing in the morning, in those days, there was nothing there. Yeah. There were no nobody was living there. There were some a whole bunch of banks and some hotels for the bankers that came in during the week or whatever. It was dead. It was and and I'm not even sure how legal our shooting was. Right. We even had like cops, you know, holding back traffic or anything. You could never do that today, of course. And and even the simple things with the the lenses that the the D DP used and um and, and and we all were in it together, you know? We were like, yeah, this is bare bones. Okay, the makeup guy hasn't shown up today, so we'll do our own makeup, right. you know, um, <laughs> for whatever reason. And and we, you know, we, we went with the wardrobe person and shopped, uh, which was so much fun. I mean, I love my clothes. I got to keep a lot of my clothes on oh, nice. that, that movie. Um but yeah, it was, it was bare bones and we were in it together and you had to be creative. Right. Everyone on the Everyone's team invested. is invested to your, you know, to mm -hmm. take it back where we started from, to your point with like mm -hmm. a dance, a dance troupe, you know, mm -hmm. they, if everyone does their best job, everybody looks better Absolutely. <laughs> instead of like, well, I was fine. Everyone else, I don't know. you know, like yeah, it's, yeah, it, yeah, that yeah. doesn't it help would, anyone. doesn't help anyone. You have to be, yeah, you have to be completely in sync and that's, absolutely what needs to happen on a, a movie set it, in general, especially a small, intimate kind of character -y driven thing, which I, I, I'm really so proud to have been involved with those little movies, you know, that have had such a long life, such longevity. And um, I know that a lot of it has to do with the fact that it was around the time 
of VHS. And, and, and a lot of these movies were like babysitters for, for the appropriate age children. Right. And sometimes <laughs> um, <not>. but I, <laughs> Yeah. But I feel like it was also the, the characters, part of the longevity is because the characters are so identifiable or, or relatable, you know, um, you could see yourself in these characters and it, it like the last starfight is such a great m- uh, message, you know, when it comes, you grab on with both hands and hold tight. And uh, that's one of my favorite lines in that movie. And it's not exactly what it was, was, but, no, but the, you know, it's the, the concept. It's, yeah, it's the con- it's the characters are so good. You can rewatch these things like the plot, yeah. not that the plot doesn't matter, but like once you know the plot, it doesn't ruin yeah. the movie. So you're like on the edge of your seat to see what happens next. It's almost better. The more you watch it, because now you can pay more attention to the small things and the yeah. character stuff, because you're not so hooked onto the plot and, and you are rewarded almost the more you see them. And that's, it's hard to do that. It's hard work to mm-hmm. do that, which is why a lot of people don't bother to do it, but it's yeah. so much more rewarding. Yeah. It's, it, 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 these movies are accessible. I feel like it's, it, it, the movie industry also, you know, they say, well, that's what kids have a short attention span these days. We have to do all this and bang them over the head. And start, but that's what all they're exposed to. I feel like it dummies down the audience when you just cater to whatever you think you think they want or what you think is going to make you a ton of money. If that's all they're exposed to, that's what they'll get. But I, I, it's, it's a shame because I really feel like it dummies down the audience. Yeah. You get a self-fulfilling prophecy with that when of course that's what they're going to be used to watching if that's all you're giving them. <laughs> so mm-hmm. It's a weird right. thing. But I'm curious to see where things go in the future with we get this generation of kids and who will be the creative people next mm-hmm. who are growing up with things like Netflix and with these things where they do dip into older stuff um, and they kind of look at it all in the same keel. Like the mm-hmm. weirdest thing to me is that Friends has become the Brady Bunch of like millennials. Like they were, like I would never have guessed that. Or you know mm-hmm. you never know what 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 weird thing from the past they'll latch onto and then have that mm-hmm. influence. Um, now that they are able to dig into this stuff and it's not just, here's everything we think you want. There's also mm-hmm. some stuff over here that you might, might stumble on and mm-hmm. it might change where you look at things. So I, I have some amount of hope that, that things might change, mm-hmm. but you know, who mm-hmm. knows? Who knows? Yeah. It's, it is interesting with this, the streaming nowadays and, and, the access to all these shows. It's kind of, it surprises me too, because I remember when my kids were really young and friends was like on, I love friends. I actually auditioned for friends <laughs> for the Jennifer Aniston role. Oh wow! And I remember reading that script specifically thinking, this is really good. This is really funny and really good. I lo- loved it. And uh, of course, disappointed that you know i didn't get it or whatever but of course it would be the same show unless it was jennifer aniston yeah. it would have been nice though yeah. it would have been uh, oh absolutely you know, i would have been okay financially yeah. for the rest of my life. <laughs> having said that that would have been a fun show to shoot but um I, 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 so i watched it all the time um because i thought it was great i just really enjoyed it as a show but my kids thought it was so stupid and blah 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 well, guess who's watching it now? Yeah. You know, they think it's great. They think it's it's really a great show. And it, it is a good show. So it is nice to see a new generation kind of tapping into um, that sort of stuff. And hopefully, I mean, I guess on the upside, there is so much um, access to all the old stuff from, you know, silent movies all the way to, you know, what modern movies today um and it, even i have been sort of exploring really old movies lately um just because i i i i'm so curious about just kind of like the foundation of movie making and i appreciate them so much more i used to like silent movies i'm like oh god are they ever overacting right well you know, there's a reason for that, obviously, but like things like the lighting was really incredible. And when you think of how basic all the equipment and things was, it's amazing what they accomplished. Yeah. You know, it really is. It, it, there's some incredible movies, you know, Lillian Gish and all these 
incredible actors uh, and such wonderful storytelling that does and should influence storytelling today. I really kind of enjoyed having that access to and looking back at incredible female directors from those days. It wasn't totally common, but from what I understand, very, very early in filmmaking, directors were female because they thought that was a girl's job. (laughs) And then it completely became only man. And now we're slowly, oh, gee, girls can direct too. What What a concept. So it, it's fascinating. It is fascinating. And hopefully, you know, serious filmmakers, young filmmakers will take advantage of the fact that they can um, really do a ton of research. Th- there's an upside of that also. I mean, that it's easy now to make movies, you know, and you can do them quite cheaply. But the downside is also there are people that are making movies cheaply that really shouldn't be making yeah, movies. <laughs> yeah. And they wouldn't have been able to before, or you no. know, they wouldn't have been able, you know, they would have had to rehearse for two weeks because they couldn't afford to burn that much film on takes. So the cast would have this real, you know, they'd really gel, but now it's like, well, it's digital. We could shoot as much as we want and, fi- and fix it. Later. Like there's just mm-hmm. different mechanics sort of change the way they make things. But you know, the access is amazing. You know, you can it's access amazing. anything. You can l- read about a, Man from Atlantis episode of TV Guide, and then watch it immediately. Pay two ninety nine yeah. on YouTube and, and watch like, Man from Atlanta. But that's insane, you know. I mean, with the exception of maybe Powderheads, which I don't know if we could watch that. You should check out YouTube; they have an amazing catalog. There? I don't know; I'm not positive, um, but it, it it's entirely possible. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It, it back in the day, you had to really work your way up in the ranks, you yeah. know. Um, and, and so by the time you were directing a movie or shooting a movie or whatever you were on a set, you knew exactly what you were doing. And now, yeah, there's lots of stuff being shot that, um, is just sort of, yeah, it's like you, uh, you needed know. about two years of practice first before you got to this point. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, I think that'll shake out eventually, I think. Hopefully. I, I think, think so, the talent too. will catch up with the technology and, you know, we'll start to see that sort of stuff. But, mm. I, you know, if I knew positively, I'd be much more wealthy or wealthy <laughs> at all. <laughs> Sounds like you're doing... Uh, what you want to be doing, which is great. Yeah. And you're, you're really, really good at it. I, I swear stand up comedians are the smartest people. Well, most <laughs> of them are the smartest people on the planet earth because you have to take real situations and, you know, turn them into something that is humorous for an audience. It's I, truly, I really think that oh, I think you. that comedians are brilliant if they're, you know, especially successful ones or whatever. I mean, if you're not good at it, you, you're yeah. not going to. Oh, bad comics are real bad. Uh, yeah. Are, are real bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, yeah, you can't just repeat last night's uh, comedian, yeah. <laughs> you know, or whatever. Yeah. It's a um, weird skill set. It's a weird skill set. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's odd to realize that not everyone's wired that way because it's like, I, I, I always say to people and they're like, Oh, how do you do that? I'm like, well, it's so much easier to go in front of a room of a thousand people and talk about personal stuff than it is one-on-one. <laughs> like, I'm not, <laughs> like it's, it's sort of faceless at yeah. that, you know, like it's sort of what, or like, you know, I always say, you know, I'll go do that. But if someone's like, we're ordering a pizza, will you call the place? And I'm like, Oh no, no, I don't want to do that. So it's like a weird uh, yeah. wire. Yeah. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. I, 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 I hear you for sure. Like for me standing in front of an audience and trying to be funny, all I would just be so self judgmental, yes. you know, and just think somebody's not going to love me. I just know it. I just know it. I mean, if, uh, like on stage in a play, for instance, not so much because you've had so much time to rehearse and it's usually, you know, a piece that has has some sort of reputation or whatever for being a, a good play or whatever. You And you're working with a whole bunch of other people so you can kind of like blame other people. Right, right. On the, a camera, you're theoretically the director will guide you. That doesn't happen all the time, but... Um, but it's standing on a stage in front of an audience and and trying to make them laugh would just terrify me, <laughs> terrify me. So well, I admire that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the thing I always say to comics, and, and some people take this as an insult, weirdly, like when they're first starting, I go, go mm-hmm. look, the great thing about this is you do it and it's gone. Like this performance mm-hmm. is gone. And the best analogy I can come up with is being a chef. 
in that mm -hmm. you create the recipe, but you have to recreate that every night and the person eats it and then it's done and it's over and then you have to do mm -hmm. it again. But the good part is if you, if one of them, if it's bad one night, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and most people, yeah, unless well. it's exceptionally yeah. bad or exceptionally good, don't really remember it anyway. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You, know, you try for one or the other, but you know it doesn't always work out that way. But it's yeah, it's weird. I haven't done it in over a year now, which is the longest I've gone. Uh, in like how are you feeling years. about that? Are you missing it? Are you dying to get back? Uh, yes and no. Like it's it's, I miss the sort of it's not a cat and mouse, but the sort of sort of intellectual um, practice of having to engage an audience and like, well, yeah. Um, but at the same time, like, I'm like, oh, I kind of hated having to hang around and like watch a bunch of bad comics, <laughs> like, yeah, right, right. Drive, you know, like chase down checks and whatever. Um, so there's things I yeah. miss and things I don't. Thankfully I have this, which, which is sort of scratching the itch in, in a, in a lot of ways. And I had this before, like so many people I know who were, you know, working comics are like, Oh no, what do I do? I'll start a thing online. And then it's like a whole, it's not like organically grown and it's, it's a real pain for them. Um, yeah. I was doing this before, but, um, it's going to be strange when it starts to come back. Like I, I, I it's, I'm going to be rusty. Like I had, at least an album's worth of stuff I had planned on recording and, and doing that. I'm like, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> you know, so yeah. Yeah. You'd have to, and, right. You'd um, have to, um, yeah, get, you know, uh, lubricate the squeaky wheels. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> we'll see, but you know, it's, it's been interesting. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a bizarre, bizarre time. I'm, yeah, I'm. It, it, you know, it's sort of my lifestyle anyway. I'm, 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 I'm kind of a loner anyhow. I'm right. not like I don't necessarily have to go out and be about, around a whole ton of people. Same. But I do like moving around. Yeah. And um, it's hard not to. It's really, really hard not to. It's nice um, to have free will and choice. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to be able to be solitary without having to be <laughs> exactly exactly yeah so anyway but this too will pass it's true we'll get there we'll get there cool well, thank <gasps> you so much it's been so great to talk to you i'm glad we finally got to do this i know i i don't you know it was years ago that you asked me to do this right? yeah yeah it was yeah. like <laughs> Years and years ago, and I, I, don't, I forget, I don't know what happened exactly. I think we just weren't in the same place. Like, I would be in LA when you were in New York, and it was, York, it just didn't work. Yeah. It just, well, I'm glad you pursued it. So, thank you. And I've really been enjoying listening to your shows, and, and it's really fun when I know the people. Oh, too. Thank you. There you go. As promised, Catherine is great. I enjoyed talking to her, and I know you enjoyed listening to me talk to her because she's fantastic. Uh, again, let me know anything, really, at tvguidanceconcert at gmail.com. Although, confessions to crimes, I am not bound by any sort of attorney, client privilege, or that privilege with a priest, so I would have to turn you into the authorities. But if for some reason you wanted to tell me that, you could. But that's a whole other discussion. But love hearing from you guys. Uh, we'll be here next week. I have a brand new episode that I know you're going to love. So we'll see you again next time for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. I love your listeners. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was very satisfactory.